Now well, there's my quarantine haircut grown in one week. What do you think? Greetings one and all and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade. Backtracks is the order of business for today's video. Yes, Backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries divisible by five with at least one spotlight album review. And yes, uh, you'll notice that it's coming to you again near the end of the month. Uh, try as I might to get it to you earlier in the month so that if you happen to have a, a favorite album in amongst my shout out albums or my spotlight albums, uh, that you can have time that month to celebrate it in whatever way you want to which I would assume, since it's an album, would be listening to it would be the way that you would probably celebrate it. But anyway, uh, yes, I'm going to try and make a concerted effort, even though I've said this before, uh, this year, by the end of the year at the very latest, to keep getting this feature to you earlier on in the month. Uh, but yeah, it's not like we don't have any excuses for being behind uh, the game right now with uh, the craziness of the world, no explanation necessary. But anyway, uh, enough wasting time. Let's just uh, catapult ourselves into the fray and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of April 2020. 65 years ago this month, Sammy Davis Jr. released his debut album starring Sammy Davis Jr. With this album, Davis became the first African-American solo artist to reach number one on the Billboard 200. This was his only number one album, by the way. Five of the album's tracks had been released as singles over the previous year. Hey There was a top 20 hit in the US and the UK. Because of You went top 10 in Australia. And This Is My Beloved and Birth of the Blues charted in the Australian Top 15. In November of 1955, Davis lost his left eye in a serious car accident, which is why he was wearing an eye patch on the album cover. Also released in April of 1955 was Frank Sinatra's ninth album In the Wee Small Hours. Produced by Voyle Gilmore and arranged by Nelson Riddle, it was not only the first Sinatra album released in the 12-inch LP format, but it's widely considered to be one of the very first concept albums all of its songs addressing themes like lost love, loneliness, and failed relationships. It spent 18 weeks at number two on the Billboard album chart, his longest sustained position on that chart up to that time. The album is ranked number 101 in Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. Six decades ago this month, Elvis Presley released his fourth album, Elvis Is Back. His first album since his Christmas album two and a half years earlier, as well as being his first stereo recording, it was recorded and released within five weeks after his return from a two-year stint in the Army. It reached number two on the Billboard Albums chart and number one on the UK Albums chart, and incredibly took almost 40 years to achieve gold certification by the RIAA. It includes the singles The Girl of My Best Friend, Girl Next Door Went A-Walkin', and Reconsider Baby. April of 1960 also saw the release of the Sarah Vaughan album Dreamy. Arranged and conducted by Jimmy Jones and featuring Harry Sweets Edison on trumpet, it was her first album on the roulette label. It includes her interpretations of standards such as Crazy He Calls Me, I'll Be Seeing You, a musical adaptation of the Joyce Kilmer poem Trees, and the Harold Arlen song Stormy Weather. In April of 1965, Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass released their fourth album, Whipped Cream and Other Delights. During its Billboard chart run of 185 weeks, the album spent eight weeks at number one and was one of the band's most successful releases. It was a departure from the Latin sound of their previous albums and included instrumental arrangements of popular food and drink themed songs, such as Love Potion Number no. 9, A Taste of Honey, and the Johnny Mercer tune Tangerine. Just as popular as the music was the album's cover art, which has been parodied by rock band Soul Asylum, comedian Pat Cooper, and for Alpert tribute albums by The Frivolous Five, Dave Lewis, and Peter Nero. Also released 55 years ago this month was Marianne Faithfull's album Come My Way. Released on the same date as her self-titled debut, the pop album the label wanted her to do, this is technically her sophomore release, the folk album she wanted to do. It contains renditions of traditional folk tunes such as House of the Rising Sun, Bells of Freedom, and Marianne. It peaked at number 12 on the UK Albums chart, whereas her pop album peaked at number 15. And I'm sure you're asking, why didn't she just put out one album with a mix of both genres? She didn't want to. Half a century ago this month, Paul McCartney released his solo debut album, McCartney. Although he recorded it as a reaction to John Lennon's private announcement to his bandmates that he was leaving the group, the album and McCartney himself were largely blamed for the Beatles' breakup. Nevertheless, it reached number two on the UK Albums chart and topped the Billboard chart for three weeks, until it was knocked out of the top spot by The Beatles' Let It Be. Although it was never released as a single, the album's highlight and one of my personal favorite McCartney tracks was the ballad Maybe I'm Amazed, which Rolling Stone includes on their list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. Also released in April of 1970 was Chris Christopherson's debut album, Christopherson. 
Already a successful songwriter, Christofferson reached number 10 on the country chart with this album of self-penned songs, many of which other artists had already made hits or would in the following years, including Sunday Morning Comin' Down, later released as a single by Johnny Cash, Me and Bobby McGee, made famous by Janis Joplin, and For the Good Times, also recorded by Bill Nash. The album enjoyed greater success when re-released under the title Me and Bobby McGee the following year. Celebrating its 45th anniversary this month is Toys in the Attic, the third album by Aerosmith. Their most successful release, it peaked at number 11 on the Billboard 200 and number 7 on the Canadian Albums Chart. It has since been certified eight times platinum in the U.S. and is included on Rolling Stone's list of the greatest albums of all time. Single Sweet Emotion became a top 40 hit in the U.S. and Walk This Way reached the top 10 of both the Billboard Hot 100 and the Canadian Singles Chart. When covered by hip-hop group Run DMC 11 years later, Walk This Way became an even bigger hit, reaching number one in New Zealand, number four in the U.S., and going top ten in eight other countries, and reinvigorating Aerosmith's sagging career with a decade-long streak of multi-platinum albums. Also in April of 1975, Joan Baez released her album Diamonds and Rust. It reached number 28 on the Canadian Albums Chart and number 11 on the Billboard 200. It featured several songs written by other artists, including Simple Twist of Fate by Bob Dylan, Hello in There by John Prine, and Never Dreamed You Leave in Summer by Stevie Wonder. The title track was a top 40 single on the Billboard Hot 100 and a top 20 hit on the Canadian Adult Contemporary Singles Chart. Joni Mitchell contributes vocals to the song Dita, and Joan Baez's backing band on the album included guitarist Larry Carlton, saxophonist Tom Scott, and keyboardist Joe Sample. Four decades ago this month, Boz Skaggs released his ninth album, Middleman. Moving back to the soul-influenced sound of his seventh album, Silk Degrees, and bringing back members of Toto to again serve as his backing band, the album peaked at number eight on the Billboard 200 and spawned two top 20 Billboard Hot 100 hits. Breakdown Dead Ahead reached number 15, and JoJo hit number 17. Also making instrumental contributions to the album were Ray Parker Jr., Carlos Santana, David Foster, and James Newton Howard. April of 1980 also saw the release of British Steel, the sixth album by Judas Priest. It peaked at number four in the UK and Greece, and number 34 on the Billboard 200, achieving platinum certification in the US in 1989. Its first two singles, Living After Midnight and Breaking the Law, both reached number 12 on the UK singles chart. United peaked at number 26. Rolling Stone ranked it at number three on their list of the greatest metal albums of all time, and it's also included in the book 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. In April of 1985, Eurythmics released their fourth album, Be Yourself Tonight. Their best-selling release, it topped the album's chart in Australia, peaked at number two in Norway, number three in Canada and the UK, and was a top ten album in the US. Four successful singles were released from the album, including Would I Lie to You, which reached number one in Australia and number five in the US, There Must Be an Angel Playing With My Heart, which featured Stevie Wonder on harmonica and was their only UK number one single, Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves, which featured vocals by Aretha Franklin and went top 10 in the UK and top 20 in the US, and It's All Right, Baby's Coming Back, a top 20 hit in the UK. All four singles went top 10 in Ireland and top 20 in New Zealand. The album track, Adrian, featured harmony vocals by Elvis Costello. Also released 35 years ago this month was Men at Work's third album, Two Hearts. Their least successful album, it peaked at number 16 on the Australian Albums Chart and at number 50 on the Billboard 200. Its only charting single out of the four released, Everything I Need, barely cracked the Australian Top 40 and missed the US Top 40. This would prove to be the band's final album, as two members left before recording sessions started, and one other left shortly before they were completed. And yeah, I have a soft spot for this album, even though it was their least successful and probably the least Men at Work-ish album in their catalog. Yeah, what can I say? I love the band. This was one of my uh, holy trinity of 80s bands back in the 80s, as I've probably said before. Good album. At least to me it is. In April of 1990, Public Enemy released their third album, Fear of a Black Planet. It peaked at number 10 on the Billboard 200 out of 27 weeks on the chart, and coincidentally it reached number 4 on the UK, Australian, and New Zealand album charts. Five singles were spawned from the album, two of which, Fight the Power and 911 is a Joke, topped the Billboard Rap Singles charts. Welcome to the Terror Dome reached number 3 on the Billboard Rap Singles chart and made the top 20 in the UK. 911 is a Joke was also a top 40 hit on the Billboard Hot 100. The album appeared on several year-end lists of best albums and Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. It was also added to the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry in 2005. 
Also released 30 years ago this month was En Vogue's debut album Born to Sing. It reached number three on the Billboard R&B Hip Hop Albums chart and just barely missed the top 20 of the Billboard 200, peaking at number 21, although it did achieve platinum certification within six months. Three of the album's four singles, Hold On, Lies, and You Don't Have to Worry, topped the Billboard R&B Singles chart. Hold On also peaked at number two on the Billboard Hot 100 and in the top 10 in the UK, New Zealand, and the Netherlands. It also earned in vogue a Grammy nomination for Best R&B Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals. In April of 1995, Wet 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 released their fourth album, Picture This. It peaked at number one on the album charts in the UK and Austria, and was a top 10 album in the Netherlands, Germany, Norway, and Switzerland. It includes the group's most popular single, a cover of the Trog's Love is All Around, which was originally recorded for the soundtrack to the movie Four Weddings and a Funeral. It was the second longest-running number one single in UK chart history at 15 weeks, and reached number one in over 10 other countries. Follow-up single, Julia Says, reached number three in the UK and Ireland. Subsequent singles, Don't Want to Forgive Me Now and Somewhere Somehow, both hit number seven on the UK singles chart. Also released a quarter of a century ago was Astro Creep 2000, the fourth and final album by White Zombie. It was also the most successful album, peaking at number six on the Billboard 200 and number 16 on both the Australian and New Zealand album charts. Its most popular single was also the band's most popular. More Human Than Human reached the top 10 of the Billboard mainstream rock tracks and modern rock tracks charts and peaked at number 11 on the Australian singles chart and number one on the Canadian alternative songs chart. It also earned White Zombie their second Grammy nomination for Best Metal Performance. Among the samples heard in the album's tracks are sound clips from the movies Shaft and Dawn of the Dead and the reality TV series Cops. Happy 20th anniversary this month to No Doubt's fourth album Return of Saturn. Their first album in four and a half years, it peaked at number two in the US and Canada, achieving platinum certification in both countries by June. It was a top 10 album in Germany, Finland, Sweden, and Switzerland. The single, Simple Kind of Life, the only release from the album to chart on the Billboard Hot 100, was a top 40 hit, but preceding singles, New and Ex-Girlfriend, reached the top 10 of the Billboard Alternative Songs chart. Ex-Girlfriend peaked at number 9 on the Australian Singles chart, and single, Bathwater, reached number 4 in Belgium. Also released in April of 2000 was Dove's debut album, Lost Souls. Recorded over the course of four years, during which time the band's recording studio burned down, their mentor manager Rob Gretton died, and they backed Badly Drawn Boy on several tracks of his debut album, Lost Souls reached number 16 on the UK Albums chart. All three singles from the album, The Cedar Room, Catch the Sun, and The Man Who Told Everything, peaked in the top 40 of the UK and Scottish singles charts. Catch the Sun was covered by Jamie Cullum on his album Catching Tales. April of 2005 saw the release of Something To Be, the solo debut album by Matchbox 20 frontman Rob Thomas. It made Billboard chart history by being the first solo debut album to enter the chart at the top spot by a male artist from a previously charting rock or pop group. The album also reached number one in Australia, number two in Canada, and number 11 in the UK. Lead-off single, Lonely No More, was a top 10 hit in the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Sweden. Subsequent singles, This Is How a Heart Breaks and Ever the Same, charted in the top 40 in Australia and New Zealand. Also released 15 years ago this month was Garbage's fourth album, Bleed Like Me. It peaked at number four in the US, the UK, and Australia, becoming the band's first top 10 album in the US. And it went top 10 in seven other countries, including Canada, France, and Mexico. Its first single, Why Do You Love Me, reached number eight on the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart and was a top 10 hit in the UK, their highest charting single there in nine years. It was also a top 20 single in Canada and Australia. 10 years ago this month, MGMT released their sophomore album, Congratulations. Departing from their synth-driven sound to a more guitar-based aesthetic, the album topped the International Albums chart in Greece, as well as Billboard's top alternative albums and top rock albums charts. It peaked at number two on the Billboard 200 and number four on the Canadian and UK albums charts. It was a top 10 album in seven other countries. Out of the four singles released from the album, just the first single, Flash Delirium, charted, and only on the Canadian and UK singles charts. The album cover art was done by Trinidad-born artist Andrew Ausgang, who also designed the cover art for Apollo 440's album, Dude Descending a Staircase. Also in April of 2010 came Sharon Jones and the Dap King's fourth album, I Learned the Hard Way. This throwback soul album reached the number six spot on the Billboard R&B albums chart and peaked at number 16 on the Billboard 200. It was a top 20 album in Norway and reached number 22 on the Canadian albums chart. Music publications including Paste, Mojo, and Pop Matters placed the album on their lists of the best albums of 2010. 
In April of 2015, Brian Wilson released his 10th solo album, No Peer Pressure. Receiving mixed reviews, it only peaked at number 28 on the Billboard 200, number 22 in the Netherlands, and number 25 in the UK. Three singles were released from the album, but none of them charted. And honestly, I've got, since I own it, obviously, uh, I've got a soft spot for this album. What can I say? Uh, the thing that I love about it are the guest appearances on this album. Uh, Casey Musgraves, uh, Nate Ruiz from Fun is on here, as well as uh, Peter Hollins, who is a kind of a local hero in the Eugene, Oregon area here. He was part of the acapella group on the rocks that I told you about uh, recently. And also uh, his Beach Boys bandmate, Al Jardine, uh, appears on several tracks. She and him are on a couple of tracks on here, or at least one track on here. And um, Mark Isham is also on here. So it's a fun album with a lot of guest uh, artists appearing on it if you decide to pick it up and listen to it. As I said, I've got a soft spot for it. What can I say? Also released five years ago this month was Shawn Mendes' full-length debut album, Handwritten. It topped the album's charts in the U.S., Norway, and Mendes' native Canada, and was a top ten album in six other countries. It enjoys double platinum certification in the U.S. and Sweden, and triple platinum certification in Canada and Denmark. First single, Life of the Party, was a top ten hit in Canada and New Zealand, and reached the top 40 in the U.S., Something Big just missed the top 10 in Canada, but the biggest hit to come from the album was Stitches, which hit number one in the UK and went top five in several other countries, including Denmark, Germany, the US, and Australia. The album scored Juno Award nominations for Album of the Year and Pop Album of the Year. Okay, now that I've had a nice long lunch break, I'm ready to bring you my two Spotlight albums for the month of April. And yes, I'm sorry if uh, during that last bit that I'd filmed, if you heard my stomach rumbling on camera, because uh, it was rumbling, so... If you did, my apologies. What can you do, right? If you're hungry, you're hungry, right? But anyway, yes, as I said, I have two Spotlight albums this month. And interesting because I actually found both of these in the $1 LP section at House of Records. So yeah, it, this, so this kind of serves a, as an extension to my A to Z series for this year. Uh, if, if I hadn't decided to do my A to Z, would I have found these albums or not? You know, who knows? But anyway, this first album uh, is turns 35 years old this month. It was released in April of 1985. It is Mathematics, the 12th album by Melissa Manchester. She is an American uh, recording artist. Uh, she started out in the 70s. And interestingly, I didn't realize this until I did the research for this video. She was discovered by Barry Manilow and was introduced to Bette Midler by Barry Manilow. And Bette Midler hired her as one of her backup singers. So that's how Melissa Manchester got started. But anyway, um, yeah, she was, up until the early 80s, Melissa Manchester was more of a singer-songwriter, acoustic-based uh, artist. And in the early, the first half of the 80s, like a lot of artists did, she jumped on the synth-driven new wave bang bandwagon. And uh, this is uh, one such album. And I was kind of... Uh, hoping to like it. I, I was kind of had my hopes up maybe a little bit too high because yes this album ended up disappointing me quite a bit. It's not a bad album it's just I was expecting more out of it. I, I was expecting more memorable songs. Um, one of her first uh, hits in that new wave style was You Should Hear How She Talks About You which was actually her biggest hit. That is not on this album that was on the album before this or the one before the one before this. I'm not sure but uh, so yeah Unfortunately, nothing quite as catchy on this album, but yeah, I kind of, I loved the cover aesthetic on this, because you can see the uh, the text here over the uh, paint smears. I kind of like that. It's just, you know, it's very 80s. I was I was kind of expecting, uh, when I first saw this album cover, I was kind of expecting a new wave-ish sound. Uh, but yeah, as I said, not terribly memorable songs on here. Uh, not bad, just not great. Uh, Victims of the Modern Heart is the opening track. That was pretty good. And the actual, the, the last track on the album, Just One Lifetime, is kind of a, a an inspirational type of song. I, I like that one. I really enjoyed that one. All Tied Up is the last track on side A, and that was pretty good. That had a pretty decent hook to it. But uh, yeah, I have to say, and I hate to say this about Melissa Manchester because I like her, uh, this was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, it's a bit of a letdown. Again, as I said, not a terrible album, not a bad album, just not a great album. But uh, still, you know, give Melissa Manchester a try. Uh, I unfortunately don't know the name of the album that you should hear how she talks about you was on, but that was a great hit out of the 80s. Uh, her, her best, her biggest hit, and I think her best hit. But yeah, Mathematics by Melissa Manchester, an okay album. You know, unfortunately, probably the uh, most disappointing of my Backtrack Spotlight albums so far, at least in this year. 
Uh, yeah. But again, yeah, sad to say that about Melissa, Melissa Manchester. Uh, oh, that album, by the way, uh, it only reached number 144 on the Billboard album chart. So that kind of tells you. And it was actually her first album on the MCA label after she left Arista Records. Uh, after I don't know if her, if her contract just simply expired or if they actually kicked her off their roster. But, you know, that's possibly unfairly, but that in, in a way is kind of telling about how disappointing I personally found that album. So... But yeah, don't let that scare you away from Melissa Manchester. She is still a great artist, and I believe she's still recording, actually. Her last album was within the past 10 years, I think, so she's still doing her thing. But anyway, on to the second of my two Spotlight albums for the month of April, and this one was a much more worthwhile listen. And I, again, not to say that the Melissa Manchester album was a waste of time. It wasn't. I'm glad I listened to it, glad I picked it up. Um, it satisfied my curiosity, if nothing else. I'm If, if I hadn't known... If I hadn't listened to it, I wouldn't know what it sounds like, right? So uh, there you go. And But again, yeah, it wasn't a terrible album. I'm glad I picked it up. Uh, but yeah, this one was a much more, I want to say fun listen, but uh, that's not really the right word uh, considering the mood of the album. Uh, not that it's really down, but it's, it was a more fulfilling listen. Let's put it that way. Uh, it is, before I go on any further, let me just introduce the album. It is the sixth album by Gordon Lightfoot. It is called If You Could Read My Mind. That is actually the revised title. The original title of the album was Sit Down, Young Stranger. And this is his sixth album and was released in April of 1970. So it is 50 years old this month. Big anniversary for this one. And it was actually Gordon Lightfoot's biggest selling album. And uh, much like his fellow Canadian Leonard Cohen, Gordon Lightfoot is very much in the folk vein. And uh, this, he's got a voice, a beautiful voice that just suits it perfectly. And a fair bit of this album is just Gordon Lightfoot's voice and his acoustic guitar. So yes, very pleasant, very, very pleasant stuff. Mellow kind of stuff that you could listen to just to unwind on, you know, a Sunday afternoon. Ironically, I'm filming this on Sunday afternoon, so there you go. But uh, yeah, just uh, very good stuff. And uh, this actually has uh, the the title track, according to the revised title of the album, if you could read my mind, is one of his most famous songs. Uh, it actually reached number one on the Canadian charts and number five on the U.S. charts. And uh, the album, incidentally, uh, in the States, reached number 12 on the Billboard chart. Uh, but yeah, and yes, so yeah, the uh, if you could read my mind is probably his most recognizable song perhaps aside from uh, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, but yeah, this is just, as I said, just very, very pleasant, mellow, folk pop stuff. I really, really enjoyed this one. Uh, pretty much every song in here. And actually, uh, coincidentally, I mentioned the song Me and Bobby McGee earlier on in my shout-out albums. That song is on this album here. Baby It's All Right is another song that really um, uh, jumped out at me, as well as Your Love's Return, which was... Uh, those three songs I just mentioned are actually right in a row, neck, uh, right after each other. Your Love's Return, that was a beautiful, beautiful ballad. It's got some of the best lyrics on the album, just gorgeous, gorgeous lyrics. But yeah, from uh, one end to the other, this album was pretty darn good. And I am looking at the credits on the back here now, and I didn't realize. Ry Cooter plays uh, bottleneck guitar on one track, at least on here. John B. Sebastian, and I don't know if that's the John Sebastian from The Love and Spoonful or a different John Sebastian. He plays the auto harp in... Uh, one track and the uh, electric guitar on another. So I guess this is not as much just Gordon Lightfoot and his acoustic guitar as I thought it was. But uh, yeah, uh, and a couple of the songs were arranged by Randy Newman. So yeah, this album is, uh, you know, even setting aside the big names that appear on this album, it's just, it's very much worth a listen. It's just great. If you're looking to dip your toe into folk music and you haven't done so much uh, yet, uh, yeah, this is a very worthwhile album and yeah, Gordon Lightfoot, much like, as I said, his uh, his uh, fellow countryman, uh, Leonard Cohen, I just recently dipped, in, dipped into his stuff also. Unfortunately, it wasn't in time for my Canada Week special last year. But uh, yeah, this is just, I'm, I'm enjoying both artists. I've only got one album by each of them, this one as well as uh, um, Leonard Cohen's first album, Songs by Leonard Cohen, I think it was. Uh, both very enjoyable. I'm starting to get a little bit more into folk music not my biggest thing, kind of like country music is not my biggest thing, but um, what I've heard of folk, especially Canadian folk artists, uh, is is uh, sitting pretty well on my ears uh, so far. So yeah, I'm looking forward and I'm definitely going to um, check out a little bit more of Gordon Lightfoot stuff as well as Leonard Cohen's. So yeah, give this album a try if you haven't yet. If you're you know in the mood for something mellow, something pleasant to unwind to, 
very, very poetic lyrics, beautiful, delicate instrumental arrangements, uh, just a wonderful album all around. So yes, that will do it for Backtracks for the month of April 2020. Hopefully I won't make it another full month before I bring you the May Backtracks. I'm going to do my best. But anyway, yes, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Suggestions, questions, constructive criticisms, lay them on me in the comment section below. Also scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.